This is about in the Use It and Lose It tournament. And it has unfortunately been a while since I've been able to record videos, or I shouldn't say unfortunately, in a way unfortunately, but I have been working a lot and uh, during the free time I have, I have to prioritize things that don't make me want to jump out a window. And I'm not saying that <laughs> making Rome 2 videos won't be make me want to jump out a window, because uh, I actually enjoy it. But the... Basically, I have to get out in nature, do physical things, uh, like go on a 12-hour fishing trip or row a boat around a lake for 12 hours, stuff like that. If I don't do stuff like that at regular intervals, I just... Ooh, I, I, I get very, very frustrated. So... Um, so that's that. But I will, of course, be covering the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, tournament and plan on getting some l nice long recording sessions in. Now, because I like uh, Greek Heracles' games, as you probably know, I have uh, I'm going to start with uh, a series I think is going to be very good in round three, with Heracles coming up against the Pergamon. Over there of uh, Hunnic Warrior, and it's it's really cool that they're using uh, shit factions uh, this late in the tournament. Like it's almost like both of them agreed that okay, let's just play shit factions, and uh, so we so the, the the player that advances has some good factions left, and I think that's a very good idea because I, I don't know if they did it, but um, for the people who bring out the power factions now, they might struggle really really badly later on. So enough talking. Uh, about things that are not related to the game. Uh, here we have uh, mercenary, but but these mind games in tournaments, I, I quite like them. Uh, so here we have mercenary Thracian warriors for Heracles, he's commanding Macedon. He has a total of three, as many as he can have, very good choice. He has a center of uh, royal peltasts, hoplites, thorax swords, against Pergamon, decent choice, hoplites. His skirmishers are slingers, just dirt uh, mercenary Brodians in the center and Slingers. Interesting setup this. Then he has the Salians. Very good. And some Shittison Cavalry on the flanks here. So these two Thracians on the flanks uh, together with Citizen Cav. Citizen Cav isn't going to be winning any fights on their own. But together with these uh, mercenary Thracians, the Citizen Cav can take the charge from Hippias and then the Thracians go in and kill them. For poor, poor Hunnic Warrior and his Pergamon, his killing power is going to be Hippias, so he has, of course, four Hippias, he has a Pergamene Noble Cavalry General, Tarantine over there, in the center he has Archers, so the Slingers of Heracles should be able to do well there. Uh, then we have Galatian Spears, Galatian Swords, four, four of those, and uh, Hoplites out on the flanks. Yeah, Galatian Spears in the center here, so... Uh, Galatia... Uh, well, the the thing is, um, both Macedon and Galatia lack good offensive infantry. These, these, Galatian, uh, these Galatian swords are very good for their price. Extremely good, in fact, for their price. Uh, the same is true for these uh, mercenary Thracians. They lack a bit, a bit of versatility due to not having any precursors. But... It's not like you can just plop down a main line of infantry with any of these factions engage and expect to win. You have to, uh, essentially, with both Macedon and um, with both Macedon and, and Pergamon, one of their strong suits is the cavalry, the Peis and the Pergamenes, but they are so expensive. Uh, for Macedon, of course, it's the Thessalians, not so much the companions because they are so expensive, and Heracles with uh, interesting formation here, just to ward off the Tarantines. And uh, what he's doing here with, with spreading his thorax swords very thin, he's going to take fewer casualties. But if he throws precursors, it might hurt the, uh, might hurt the Tarantines a lot. And the Tarantines are just jogging about in precursor range, being cheeky. They are not firing missiles at this point, which is, uh, well, no, they're not firing missiles. And that's a good idea. Now they are firing, so these citizen cavalry are good uh, targets for the Tarantines. But the Tarantines are medium, they're not very fast, so... 
Citizen Cavalry, uh, not being tired, could actually chase away the Tarantines, but the Rockless decides against it because they could, uh, they would probably take a lot of damage in the process. Iraklis being the one to push up here, and it looks like he's going single line, but adjusting it, so he's pulling back his uh, mercenary Thracians. Uh, good choice, he definitely do don't, doesn't want to take any fire on his uh, mercenary Thracians. This Tyrantine is being annoying. It looks like uh, both players are sort of wary of engaging, and I quite understand them because uh, the player who the player who engages first, uh, I, I've talked about this before. The, the player who rushes, it might go really well against a good opponent. The uh, the a player with good micromanagement and situational awareness could very well counter every move that the rushing player makes and the, the Russian Russian the rushing player would then be at a severe disadvantage. The slingers firing a bit, doing a bit of damage to something over here, but it's it's not Galatian Spears, yeah. Galatian Spears speed bumps. And just shifting the lines here and n nothing is really happening. Hunnic Warrior is starting to rotate back a bit, but it looks like Greek Heraclius is the player who's mo the most uh, the most eager to engage, and he does have more melee units. Significantly, like the, the melee li melee line of Heraclius is much stronger than the melee line of Hunnic Warrior, but the cavalry, the cavalry of um, Hunnic Warrior, is stronger than the cavalry of of Heraclius, just not in prolonged melee. So the Hippeus can do a lot of damage to the main line of Heraclius, but uh, the thing is, they, they won't stand up well to any kind of fire. And in extended melee, of course, they will get destroyed. So a bit of maneuvering, a Hunnic Warrior pulls back. Just shifting, reorienting. Hunnic Warrior is in a very difficult position, because he's at an infantry disadvantage, which means he can't take the engagement head-on. Uh, and he is at a skirmish disadvantage, because Heraclius has the range on him. So, he has the cavalry advantage, uh, but ever so, sl ever, ever so slightly. Because Heraclius can very easily counter the cavalry of, um, the cavalry of Hunnic Warrior. I'm quite interested to see how he uses this wing of Shittison Cavalry because he has his he has his shock in the center here. Uh, then he just has doesn't have any melee cavalry over here. And um Shittison Cavalry over here. No, I'm, I'm quite interested to see how he uses that because uh, this flank is somewhat vulnerable. Ooh, this could be bad. Royal Peltas. Why didn't that Apeus go for the Royal Peltas? It's going to smash into the Hoplites. Here comes the rush. Frontal. Full frontal charge. Very nice. Let's see it, if it works. These Hoplites will be braced, but they are in a very, very, very uh, thin formation. And Thorax Sword is getting smashed. Perfectly, perfectly executed frontal assault there. Absolutely brilliantly done there. And getting in the Galatian swords, they are look at look at the Hopites getting absolutely devastated. Mercenary Thracians join in the fight, but they won't get the best charge because of how they are supporting from behind the unit. And let's see the yeah the Pergamenes and the Hippeus didn't take that much damage. It was very well coordinated, I think. So the Hopites in Phalanx will do a decent job against Thorax swords. Here we have a sneaky unit of Shittis and Cavalry. Wanting to get at these skirmishers in the center. Uh, it's probably not going to. These these units could just turn around. But very nicely done here by with the cavalry of uh, Hunnic Warrior. And the Hoplites and Thessalians are taking a beating. Here come the Galatian swords. The citizens actually managed to get into the archers. But using a uh, 500-something cavalry unit to deal with... Uh, 200 something archer archer units that's that's not cost effective however if 
Iroclus is able to defeat the cavalry, the very fragile cavalry. And, like, he's just piling in the units here. Uh, if he manages to defeat the cavalry and secure his skirmish advantage, then this isn't completely, uh, completely lost here. But at this point, it certainly doesn't look very, very good. Here we have Hippeus Lancers rushing in towards the skirmishers. Most important unit, this mercenary Rodian Slingers. The rest are slightly expendable. Let's see, the Hippeus are taking fire. They should drop quickly to, to the fire from Rodians. Uh, Hoplites just cannot hold as mainline units. More infantry pushing up the center. This is a really intense game. And holding this cavalry here is a stroke of genius, if it was intended. Because the citizens now buy the time for the infantry of Heracles, where he had the advantage to win here. And uh, all the while holding... And, and uh, holding away these very, very important important cavalry units, which means that Heracles can support here, and now when he gets his infantry in, it's over. It's over. So the Apeus are able to get to the Slingers, but they are being focused fired on uh, by from multiple angles, so... They're going to drop very quickly, uh, and th this this game is is a perfect example of, of what Pergamon lacks. The Royal Peltas taking fire from the archers, they won't like that much. But at this point it's uh, going pretty well for Macedon. The archers won't be able to fire for much longer because there are Thorax swords incoming. Very messy battle with things happening all across the battlefield, and... Was that the general? No, it was just having lost a shit ton of men. So Thessalians getting into the archers, but yeah, the, the with three men remaining, they stabilize with three men remaining. Pretty good. Always nice when that happens, if you're the one it's happening to. The Pergamenians have a few men remaining in the unit. The Galatian Spears will just get destroyed by mercenary Thracians. A lot of kills on the mercenary Thracians. But uh, th this is... Uh, I mean, th there is there is cavalry left for Pergamon. Cavalry and skirmishers, the very important combination. There is There are skirmishers left for Macedon, but Macedon doesn't really have cavalry left. These, uh, these archers are about to get caught, though. Are they charging? <laughs> they were charging. <laughs> For glory! Yep. Glorious death. Now, I wonder how much ammunition is left on these units. Heracles just consolidating his, uh, consolidating his forces here. See, they... Just judging by the kills, there are probably arrows left in the quivers of these boys. Let's see. Probably a bit late for uh, basic training now, boys. Now I am I like I'm I'm going to give the advantage to Rockless here because he just has so much left. <laughs> That's uh, fairly obvious that the player who has the most left is is usually the one whose um, chances are the best of winning. But there are these cheeky little cav units. It's just that Heracles is positioning himself in a way that um, these cavalry units are not going to be able to take out the skirmisher for free. There are infantry units hanging about. And the Pergamenes, I don't understand why the Pergamenes noble uh, are as, ex as expensive as they are. Uh, that combination of being uh, very heavy, lightly armored... And having a really good charge bonus. It's just it's just a weird combination, especially since especially since uh, what Pergamon lacks is 
is survivability in their infantry. And then they also lack survivability in their cavalry, which makes for a... Makes for a hard hitting combination that falters very quickly. So Pergamon, I'll just fast forward now because this is late game. So Heraclius is moving into sort of a... This is not really a box, this is more of a... Well, it is a box. It's just that there are skirmishers on one side. And... Um, the Hippeus are trying their best to get an angle. Uh, thing is, they're going to be exhausted. So they're going to be very slow, very slow here in charging in. A uh, bit of fire going on here against the Galatian swords, moving up towards the Galatians. Getting them off the field would be nice. They don't have the best morale, they don't have the general around to support them. So, might be able to take the Galatians off the field here. Uh, the cavalry is running by, taking a few shots. Uh, more shots incoming here. But this is, I mean, I don't see any way at this point for, uh, for Hunnic Warrior to win this. I understand that he wants to give it his best, so... Um, uh, but I just, I just don't, I just don't see what he's supposed to do at this point. Because he doesn't have enough left, he doesn't... Yeah, the general YOLO charges in and uh, gets charged in turn. So costly victory there. For Heracles commanding Macedon over Pergamon. Pergamon put up a good show. Uh, the the attack was pretty much perfectly coordinated. Uh, very nicely done there in, in the beginning. The issue though, uh, here you have, even though these are only Thorax swords, you have a you have seven melee units, two spears against four melee units and uh, five spears. These mercenary Thracians do uh Damn fine job. And going for a lot of long range skirmishers seems to have paid off for Heracles. Um, some of the cavalry does well, just it, it, the infantry falters. Galatian swords are, like I said, great for the price. It's just that they, they don't have survivability. So even when used after cavalry has uh, charged in, it's just not as effective as it would be if you had a unit that could actually survive for, for a bit. But I think Hanek Warrior did a good job. I really, really like the way he engaged. It's just too bad he had Pergamon. So this is the first in a best of three. Let's see what happens in game number two. Strength and honor.